Hola, es un gusto, bienvenido. Es raro hacer estas cosas híbridas, pero a mí ya me pasa haciendo clase porque hay poca audiencia, pero uno tiene que confiar que le está hablando una gran multitud. Así que bienvenidos todos y todas. Eh, la verdad para nosotros es un gusto poder eh, eh, ser el local y participar de, 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 este, de esta iniciativa, ¿no es cierto? El COES, lo que está es la FEN y la Universidad Mayor, es sin lugar a duda un aporte muy importante desde el mundo de la academia al mundo de la política económica. Creo que eso es lo que el, el, el comentario que quiero hacer me, me parece muy valioso, ¿no es cierto?, que tengamos modelos micros de simulaciones bien fundamentados. Debo reconocer que ayer en la tarde traté de estar leyendo para pa, pa conocer el modelo, pero me distraí viendo más aplicaciones que cómo era exactamente el modelo. Pero me di cuenta que tiene un montón de aplicaciones. Salario mínimo, ¿no es cierto?, política tributaria, y nos permite ver los efectos que tiene sobre, sobre la economía, sobre los distintos eh, grupos sociales, yo creo que tiene mucha riqueza, así que a mí me parece que es un gran aporte. Debo reconocer que no pude ver todavía su, su link, supongo que lo tendrá, de equilibrio general, porque creo que es fundamental las cosas, entenderla en equilibrio general, con función de producción, con inversión y algún grado de dinámica, pero, pero por lo menos por las cosas que, que vi, unos trabajos de Atkinson para Inglaterra, me pareció que había mucho material y mucha cosa muy interesante. Y, y, y porque estamos tarde y porque no hay muchas cosas que se me ocurrieron interesantes que decir, solo quiero decirles que hacer una, primero un llamado a, a que sigan en esto, que profundicen, pero también un llamado a los usuarios a la modestia y a la humildad académica. Nosotros hoy día estamos muy acostumbrados en Chile, y para los que no están en Chile lo verán, estamos muy acostumbrados a, a, a propuestas de política económica de académicos que están empezando a veces su carrera, o, o puede ser otro académico, y que se basan en un paper. Eso, eso es la mal, el, el, eso yo llamaría, es un defecto que tenemos todos, ¿no es cierto?, cuando queremos afirmar algunas convicciones ideológicas con ciencia. Yo creo que lo que tiene que hacer la ciencia muchas veces es más que abrirnos dudas que darnos respuestas definitivas. Es un llamado a la modestia, a saber que poco sabemos, pero que en el mundo de la política económica tenemos que tirarnos al agua y tenemos que jugarnos por algo. No tratemos de inventarle siempre que todo lo que hacemos está respaldado en un paper, simplemente un buen marco analítico, una buena justificación, ¿no es cierto? A veces sirve mucho más. Y por eso también la experiencia, no en el sentido de la edad, sino la experiencia en el sentido de conocer, de entender, de entender las políticas públicas es muy importante. Así que yo quiero con esto primero felicitarlo. Me parece que este es un tremendo aporte. Deberíamos estudiar el tema del salario mínimo en mis preferencias y también en el tema de políticas públicas, yo creo que está en el centro de cualquier discusión, ¿no es cierto?, entenderlo. Eh, el paper de Atkinson decía que en Inglaterra parecía que no había mucho efecto comparado con lo que estaba pasando con materia de, de, de cuando compara con, con, con un ajuste tributario. El gobierno de Lula y en Brasil, el gran aumento que hubo en los años 2000 de la, de, de la, la gran disminución de la desigualdad fue producto de aumento de salario mínimo, son cosas que tenemos que entender son cosas que tampoco le te, tenemos que temer y desde el punto de vista académico nosotros tenemos que proveer las ideas, algunos órdenes de magnitud y los responsables al final van a ser la gente que está a cargo de las políticas públicas. Pero, pero por eso yo creo que es un, un gran aporte y quiero felicitar a todos los que participan en esto el tipo de cosas que nosotros deberíamos hacer para crear un puente entre el pensamiento académico a veces abstracto con poca, con poca concreción hacia el mundo de las políticas públicas. Y en ese sentido, este es un tremendo aporte que como traté de decirles, sí, tenemos que tratar de tomarlo con un poco de humildad de nuestro punto de vista. De humildad, la humildad se le puede pedir a los académicos. Así que muchas gracias, bienvenido y éxito. Muchas gracias. Eh... Muchas gracias, señor decano. Y ahora vamos a pasar a la charla magistral, con lo cual damos inicio a este evento.
Y a cargo de esta charla está el profesor Sir Richard Blandell, que nos tenta la silla David Ricardo, de profesor de Economía Política del Departamento de Economía del University College London. Es director del Centro de Análisis Microeconómico de las Políticas Públicas en el Instituto de Estudios Fiscales y es caballero del Reino Unido por sus contribuciones a la economía y a las ciencias sociales. Hoy nos ofrecerá la charla titulada Desigualdad, Redistribución y Mercados Laborales. La charla será en inglés, pero hay traducción simultánea que podrán ver, eh, podrán acceder a través del, de, de la página online. Así que ahora eh, los dejo con el profesor Blandel. Eh, profesor Blandel, good morning, or rather, good afternoon. Thank you very much for being with us today. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Many, many thanks, Andres. Um, it's really great to be here speaking at your, the workshop. Um, I wish I could be in San Diego with you all, and hopefully I will be at some point uh, soon. And congratulations on Chilmod. Uh, it's a, absolutely essential to getting things right across a whole range of policies and um, it will be uh, great to engage more with you and the team as we uh, as it goes along um, so I'm going to uh, share my screen if that's okay let me just check it works um, can everybody see that Andres okay I think so I'll assume you can That's good. Yes, we see it fine. Oh, great. Okay. Um, thanks. I thought I'd talk about a broad, fairly broad set of uh, topics here. Um, and all of them relate to uh, the, the role of uh, tax and benefit simulation, but put in a rather broader context. And um, I'm going to start with uh, a discussion of two big reviews that I, I'm involved in. Um, both of them about inequality and poverty, and both where tax and benefit modeling is absolutely essential. And uh, I'll uh, talk ab about those, and I hope we can engage you uh, with them. I know some people are already engaged, and uh, I'll um, explain what they're about and what we're intending to do. Then I want to briefly touch on the role of tax and transfers in thinking about inequality and, um, and the the data we've got and how it turns out, and also uh, then look, look a little bit about why micro simulation models are so important. I'll give you a couple of examples. I'm afraid most of my examples are from uh, the UK, and uh, I've been working a little bit on various projects in Latin America, indeed with Andreas on some pretty related and exciting work in Chile, and I'll mention it, but of course, We don't have uh, a lot of results at the moment to show you, so I'm giving my perspective uh, from London, <laughs> and uh, I, I hope it's useful. And then finally, I want to touch on where what we've learned and the kind of directions we're heading, at least in uh, some of the uh, the work, which I think is relevant for understanding the role of tax and benefit models in thinking about inequality and uh, the development of inequality over over time. So let me start with a little bit of background on the Deaton Review, uh, because it's kind of set the scene uh, for a number of things happening now. And indeed, uh, we presented it in uh, at the La Sea conference in, um, in uh, Mexico uh, a few years ago. And uh, subsequently, uh, there's a, a new related project, which I'll talk to you about, which is uh, addressing mirroring this for Latin America, which is quite exciting. This review is quite broad. It's not just about economics, let alone about tax and benefit systems. It's broad uh, discussion of what inequalities matter. I think this is pretty key. Um, you know, there's lots of puzzles in why people are concerned about inequality, even though inequality might be uh, 
in principle, at least by some statistics, either stable or falling, as it has been in Chile, um, how different inequalities are related and what are the underlying forces that come together to create them. And again, I think to understand at least a, a large number of those, you really have to think hard about microdata and micro simulation. And then, uh, then how do we address the ones that concern us? And of course, we've been through the COVID pandemic and certainly in our little team, um, we wondered whether the COVID pandemic would push inequality research right down the agenda because for a little while it seemed to be uh, hitting um, across the distribution, if anything, at the top, but that soon changed. And we know that the COVID pandemic has been particularly hard hitting on the poor and the and and uh, the young and perhaps some of the elderly elderly of course this review is about the largely about the uk and it's comparative in nature but across a uh, developing world and um, the western north america and uh, europe um and measured by the genie uh, the uk is quite high in the uh, inequality statistics, uh, certainly in Europe, uh, and a little below, of course, the United States, but the comparative really is what, how the systems work and what are the comparisons and what can we learn from other countries like in Norway, Germany, and Greece, and, um, and indeed the United States. And in each of those, we're using, in fact, the uh, Euromod type simulation to look at a number of policies of course if i add in um which i only did very uh just took the statistics the other day from oecd realizing mine were a little out of date these are still a little out of date uh, but of course chile stands i think on disposable income at a genie of about 0.46 which has come down a little bit i'll discuss that but it's still high and quite persistent in many aspects. And of course, uh, it stands like many inequality statistics for Latin America and Caribbean, uh, quite a bit higher than even in the US, but certainly in Europe. And one, of course, feature of that is that the tax and transfer system hasn't been particularly successful in addressing inequality concerns in Latin America. And I guess one of the interesting issues that to delve into is perhaps how to make that work better in a way, of course, that avoids unnecessary distortions. So if I think about, of course, that's about income. We want to dig below that. I'll dig a little bit into to the ideas around wages and and families uh, as I go through today, because tax and simulation models are ideally suited for that. But we want to look in the review at much more general sets of inequality concerns, including uh, political voice and health, uh, many of the things that have become very, very salient uh, as the after the pandemic with health and, um, and over the last decade or so with the rise of populism. And differences between groups as well, which requires detailed uh, micro data by gender, by ethnicity, generations, geography, and place. The team is, uh, it's pretty international and interdisciplinary. I won't, uh, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. I just thought it would be fun to set it up with uh, Nobel Prize winner, Angus Deaton in the chair. Uh, there's quite a few people that some of you uh, may know, but just to uh, note that there's um, there are not just economists. There's Penelope B. Goldberg, I highlighted there, who was recently chief economist at the World Bank, but there are sociologists, um, psychologists, um, and uh, epidemiologists and philosophers, and probably uh, the most influential part of the panel has come from working with uh, political scientists and uh, philosophers on just getting to the nitty gritty of what concerns uh, people about inequality. And um, I think that's pretty key because in most of our work, most of our tax and benefit modeling, we think of net income, disposable income, 
But we know there's much deeper things that worry people that are part of that model as well. And I'll go a little bit into that because we think that um, the levels of inequality at work within families are all important in understanding how people uh, react um, to uh, inequality and worry about uh, low incomes and poverty. There's a set of topics, I just list these, but you can see it's very broad. The ones that are kind of key for us today and thinking about um, taxes and welfare really, I'm gonna look a little bit at family dynamics, mobility, a lot at labor markets and the interaction of those with transfers, taxes, tax credits at the bottom. So it's a really big project. And um, if I was there, I'd spend more time with you just going through what we're doing and what we're learning. But the kind of motivation really is very much from the same motivation that guides us all when we're thinking of tax and benefit model, modeling. And that is that the structure of work and families has changed dramatically in most economies over the last four decades. In the UK and the US, for example, has been particular growth in earnings inequality for men and women with adverse shocks on certain particular groups. And we want to look at how how policies um, work through social insurance and redistribution. A particular feature is the poor wage progression for the low educated and those in part time work. Of course, wage progression is a really key issue also in parts of Latin America. And in some ways, there are different kinds of trends and I'll point to those as I'm going along. But nonetheless, a key idea here is that the kind of static analysis of inequality and poverty using tax and benefit models uh, requires a little bit of adaption and you can draw not necessarily completely the correct conclusions by purely static analysis. And one good example of that is the role of employment in moving people out of poverty and long run into long run self sufficiency, certainly, and I'll point that out that 20 years ago when we were thinking of the role of EITC and in work credits and things that would get people into work, we thought that was enough and it turns out not to be uh, we there's there are aspects of human capital and good jobs and wage progression, which are really key in uh, understanding the way the tax and welfare system uh, produces or in incentivizes um, earnings and growth of earnings for families. Of course, COVID has made many of these more saliently. And I guess one theme that comes out through all of this is that we can't address all the concerns of about low wages and earnings inequality through the tax and welfare system alone. And really the key is to try and integrate, I think it was in the discussion early, integrate other policies and other aspects of, um, of intervention alongside tax, tax benefit modeling. For example, the role of human capital policies and minimum wages, how do they interact and how can we best think about that? And of course, when we put people into families with savings and human capital decisions, we get a different view of some key policy questions. And you guys know that only too well from the debate about the role of pensions and pension contributions in poverty and inequality and understanding how to incorporate them into a tax and benefit modeling framework. But first, a little about last year. So last year, is a kind of a, a mirrored on or brought out of the Deaton Review, um, and it's the Latin American Caribbean Inequality Review. Already people, many of you, in fact, are involved. It's funded again independently, mainly through the IDB at the moment. And in a sense, it's about why, despite the changes, both economically and socially, inequality in Latin America and Caribbean has persisted at quite exceptionally high levels. The panel is 
made up of a whole host of people, uh, some of which I should think all of which you'll know, um, uh, and many, I guess, Andres Velasco is particularly well known uh, to you guys, and I think already some of you are involved in uh, aspects of uh, of this this review, exciting review. And I'm hoping uh, Chillmod will have something to input into this uh, and other similar models across uh, Latin America. It's a three year study and only just started, so it's really in parallel and with the Deaton review and uh, doing a similar set of things, really. There are themes of commission studies uh, that try and dig down first into the levels and trends of inequality, the facts, um, which are, are, are beginning to be well established, but uh, they're nonetheless important and interesting. You all know about the what's happened to the changes in inequality and poverty around uh, Latin America and how some of those trends have been rather different to what we've had in Europe. Inequality in opportunity is key, I think, for understanding what concerns people about inequality. And inequality in markets is probably the one I'm directly involved in, which is the link between the markets and labor market, a role of minimum wages and policies there, and into taxation and redistribution. And of course, something on uh, inequality and political power, and uh, that's key. There's a website there for those who are interested to follow up, and I really hope we can engage um, many of you in this as it uh, goes along. I'm only a side player on the panel, really uh, bringing in the link between the review, the Deaton review, and this uh, together. So um, it's a kind of exciting thing. Of course, when we, this is a picture you all know, um, I should really have got it all updated um, and some of it is, but the redistributive impact of taxes and transfers is quite different across uh, many parts of the world. And here, this is from uh, Nora's work and some other work um, on, the, on tracing through using microdata, of course, but not really so much tax and benefit modeling at this stage, uh, the way we go from market income through to disposable income. And if you look at the uh, right hand panel, you can see that at the bottom right, down in the corner here, panel D, if you can read it, uh, you can see across, um, across Europe, the levels of underlying inequality and actually poverty in um, relative poverty at least in Europe across countries is very similar to that in panel C across Latin America. Uh, the UK has an underlying Gini nearly well above 0.5 in fact. And um, but when you go up to panel B at the top, the disposable income, you can see it drops down to levels we're more familiar with. Uh, in in the in the UK, uh, the UK going up above 0.35, uh, but quite a quite a substantive drop. If you look on the left, and I think this underestimates the impact, as far as I can tell by looking at Neuroelastic and others' recent work. Nonetheless, the difference between panel A and panel C is relatively small. So the impact of taxes and transfers has been relatively small in. Uh, Latin America, and that's something that um, obviously is a challenge to kind of understand. There is an issue of modeling incomes right at the top. It's an issue in the UK, and I notice uh, I may come back to that some work on uh, 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 in Latin America that tries to adjust that using fiscal income. And of course, one thing that's happened in tax and benefit modeling is to include both survey information and fiscal and fiscal data tax data to try and get the distribution right um, one really interesting characteristic again it's a motivation for much of your work i'm sure is the changes in genie and and, and and chile stands out as we know as somewhere where inequality has fallen back um, rather slightly, but nonetheless, over a time when it's largely increased in uh, many other economies. And again, I told Andres, I, I've sent the slides and they, 
be very happy to have them on the web page to follow up on anything. And at, at the end of this, I've put a set of references because, um, as everyone knows, I've always got too much material. And uh, so um, uh, I won't go into detail and everything. Anyway, this one thing you'll know as well as me. Uh, this is um, this is of course the uh, the the um, the uh, work from uh, Neuroelastic's paper. One really uh, interesting characteristic, which is an enormous success of the pandemic, surprisingly, and here's one rather like the panel we looked at, but with and without policy responses on the genies around Europe. There's a variety of studies. I just put a list of studies that's in a rather nice recent paper by Stephanie Stancheva in Economic Policy, which just brings together all the studies. And if you look at the very right hand, right, right if you look at the, the two right hand columns without policy response and with, that's the effect on the genie of the pandemic. Um, just one year or two years, one year in, some of it's actually using tax and benefit simulation kind of models here, I should add, because simulating the policies, which are largely ones you can simulate through tax and benefit modeling, but others are actual data, it tells you which one is there. And you can see that without policy response, the Gini would have risen, inequality would have risen quite dramatically. In fact, hugely dramatically in some places like Ireland, you can see that, and across the EU and indeed in the UK generally. But with policy responses, they're either close to zero or negative. In other words, the policy response, unlike in the 2008 um, recession, uh, completely offset, at least in these very simple statistical measures of inequality. Of course, there are huge inequalities that have opened up and it kind of already tells you that looking at income alone is not sufficient to understand what's going on in families and in the labor market and in health on inequality, but it is quite extraordinary. Most of these policies have been temporary and indeed in the UK they've just unraveled nearly all of them and we're seeing we're back to where we were in a way and we're seeing what's happening in the labor market and what have you as the temporary policies the furlough system and other support has been um, lifted but let me dig uh, a little bit below the surface using microdata and this is what I'd, I'd like to do I kind of like to do some of this with um, with with Chile and thinking about chill mod and I tell you the kind of way we think about it just taking ye across years what's happened to say underlying earnings inequality this is market inequality particular increase you can see it's almost monotonic for male earnings here in the UK very similar to the US at the bottom there's even negative gro real growth in earnings and the top it's uh, lifted. I haven't even put the top 5% because at the very top, it's just rocketed uh, it, it, the, the growth. This is just the average annual percentile growth in earnings. If I put in wages, you can see it's rather different. And this is the key role that the minimum wage actually has had in the UK. It's kind of lifted hourly wages, uh, but you kind of think, well, why hasn't it lifted earnings? And of course, there's a gap between weekly earnings and hourly wages and it's hours of work and what's happened in the UK is that at the bottom of the distribution over a long time now the attachment of lower wage men to the labour market especially working in part-time jobs and more precarious work has risen rather secularly in fact and so this is going to be a key point that you know when you're designing tax and welfare policy and minimum wage policy in the UK it's the minimum wage addresses an hourly wage then you have to worry about hours of work and uh, that's going to be a, a key key point here as we go through this an analysis of course at the top people are working pretty much the men are working pretty much the full time they always did but at the bottom it's become more precarious and indeed in the Deaton review we're focusing a lot on self-employment and particularly solo self-employment this is kind of working for uber or 
uh, or, or a, a, an outsourced cleaning cleaning job where you're self-employed but you work for yourself you have no employees with you and that's the thing that's really increased it has a lot of familiarity to and similarities to what's happened in Latin America because it's rather informal self-employed are not subject to the minimum wage they're not eligible for sickness benefit and they don't pay the same insurance contributions that allow them to be eligible to unemployment benefit and a basic pension so all those things are outside the realm of this group which has really risen now to quite a high level in the uk and if you're thinking about tax and benefit modeling you really have to think about these alternative forms of work and how they're involved and i know you guys think about the role of informality all the time well it isn't quite as different in developed economies like the uk as it as you might think this in growth in solar self-employment is really important and i'll uh, emphasize it again the role, what I wanted to talk about a little bit is the role of families, because, uh, and I know that's true in, in Chile, there's been quite a rise in the earnings and employment of women in the labor market. And it's almost a mirror image uh, to men in the UK. In fact, female wages and earnings have risen at the bottom because labor supply has increased and those earnings and their wages were low. So the effect of the minimum wage is even higher so it's almost like a, a mirror image but interestingly you might think that increasing labor supply and earnings of women at the bottom would offset what's happened to men and it does to some extent but because matching between on wages in families is so strongly assortative in the UK um, when you put this together and look at earnings inequality it really doesn't change the picture very much. It's not negative anymore. But um, but when you look at household earnings, the components of the, the shares and the assortativeness really matters to, as you go from individual earnings through to family earnings. And that's gonna be a key part of working the relationship between the labor market, minimum wages, through tax and benefits into disposable family income. Because when I put the next curve on for the UK, whoops, that one, that's what in fact has happened to the growth in disposable family income in the UK. And in fact, over this two decade or more period, there's been no growth in inequality in the UK, uh, in um, the middle of the distribution at least. Uh, this is across the percentiles. So if I look at the growth of the 10th percentile and the 90th, you can see they're identical in disposable income, even though they're not identical at all when it comes to underlying income. So the redistributive system that we model has done a huge amount of work. It's the difference between the green line and the brown line in supporting incomes in work. And in fact, uh, what we have in the UK is individuals who are now spending a large part of their working life in families with in-work support through the welfare system. And indeed, their incomes are sufficiently low that they're just on the poverty line. And we have an increase in in-work poverty. And uh, that's something we didn't expect. I'll show in a second. The great hope was that the welfare tax reforms that we did would support work and work would produce self-sufficiency. And it really hasn't delivered on what we expected. And that's the kind of theme I want to end with. And we get a big increase in um, in in work poverty, actually. The related effect is a huge growth in the expenditure on work related benefits, that is benefits that people get when they're in work to top up their incomes and earnings. We, like the EITC in the US, there's in work benefits are now the biggest expansion in the UK and the US and expanding right across Europe and uh, Canada. At the top, of course, uh, things have just gone on increasing. So at the very top of the distribution, incomes have increased, and this is the top 1%. It's got a flatter since the Great Recession, but it's in fact taken off again a bit recently. And in fact, the 
you have to be a little careful looking at genies and, and household survey income to, because they don't really neither the measurement nor the data capture the top and very well and I, I was just reading through um, a note in uh, Nora's recent work um, that we're using on the last year review and a paper I guess um, some of you there may know well by Forrest et al. Uh, Andreas and I certainly reference it, which um, looks at what happens if you use fiscal income to look at the top share in Chile, and you don't see a fall, you do still see a fall in the Gini, uh, but nonetheless at the top uh, it looks rather flat. I've no idea how correct this is, but it looks convincing, and it also suggests kind of some of the issues of people's concerns about inequality uh, 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 why they're being maintained, uh, but that's that. If you look at the minimum wage, and I think that was mentioned earlier, uh, the great thing about a tax and benefit model is you can take households, you can look at the minimum wage for particular earners, work out who's been affected, and then see how the minimum wage increase, uh, mechanically at least, uh, affects the across the distribution. And it's not particularly well targeted, we know that, because, um, because of the things I said. One is that hours of work uh, are often much lower, and so you're targeting something that's rather small anyway. And secondly, um, some minimum wage eligible adults live in families where there are other incomes that are quite reasonable. And you can see, looking at this, which we did a couple of years ago at the very rapid increase in the minimum wage in the UK, put it through the tax ban model and see where it hits. And you can see it's targeted more in the middle of the distribution. It does something at the bottom, but it's really much better targeted at the bottom of the middle of the distribution. And you can really only learn about that once you look at their interactions with the whole and tax and welfare system. And that's a theme here. In fact, what's happened when we look at the reforms in place is there's a huge redistribution of, in the reforms in the UK towards cutting those benefits at the bottom of the distribution. And that's a, a, you know, clearly a huge policy debate uh, that's going on here. So in the measurement of impacts of reforms, precisely how tax policies impact on individuals and family incomes on incentives to work, to save, to invest in human capital are really central. And to get that right, you just got to have something like a chill mod. What are the effective tax rates? That requires institutional knowledge, uh, which surprisingly is not always uh, well understood. The overlapping taxes and interactions between taxes, tax credits, and welfare benefits is really important and motivates really what we're doing here. A good example is the US. Uh, you, you may have even had people come and talk about tax reform in the US, and often they'll talk about uh, something called the earned income tax credit, which was expanded, and it's been an absolutely central reform uh, for low earners in the US. And in fact, we copied a rather similar thing in the UK and is now copied across many other countries. And that's the little triangle, the uh, little picture at the bottom here. So this tells you for a low income uh, single parent using a very simple tax model um, here, looking at all the types of benefits and credits that families can get in the US. By the way, there are, there are a large number, I think 17 for a particular low income mother. And um, Earned income tax credit is one that requires you work. So you get nothing and then it, it increases as you go into work and then decreases. And you can see that little picture at the bottom, earned income tax credit. That's a really big key reform. And often you look at that alone, but look carefully at the top. The top line, as the picture overall, is exactly the impact on the earnings of this person, sorry, the income of this person as she increases her household earnings. And look, it's much more fuzzy there. You can see that the, the very detailed incentives underlying the earned income tax credit are kind of muddied by the rest of the system. And you really have to look at that integration of the system because 
that the interactions because that's what people face and in fact if you look at the marginal tax rates that pe that this woman would face if she took up all the things she was eligible for it's pretty amazing it's quite complex and this is a kind of key theme here as we uh, know if we look at the uk and this is one i'm very familiar with because we're involved in its design um the green line is the tax credit this is just running the thing very simply through the tax and benefit model and coming up with the budget constraint that you will get from Chilmod um, as you take someone on just a bit above the minimum wage and look at the incomes they would get as the transfers they would get as their income earnings rise. And the green bit was a reform that was put in place, the working families tax credit. You can see you can only get it if you're working at least 16 hours and you get it and it's a big jump in your income. And that was to offset the uh, very, very um, high implicit tax rates in the welfare system that come from income support. You can see the pink line there is very, very flat at the top. And so it gives a big incentive, especially for part time work. And we were very optimistic at that time. Uh, we were using our model, we were writing down the incentives. And we said, Okay, this is terrific, because once we can get people into work, there's a big incentive to work, and then they move into self sufficiency, um, and earn themselves out of poverty. Of course, there's two things that happen here. First is, it's for most people, the budget constraint isn't this simple at all. In fact, it interacts with other policies. And here's two, rent rebate and council tax. So if you're in, if you're low enough income, you can get some support for your housing, but that's considered as income for the tax credit. So you can see that the jump up at part time is now much flatter. So without the tax spend model, we would never really understand the effective tax rates, the effective incentives the effective budget constraint that is facing particular individuals here. And you can see for many individuals, there's really no additional incentive to work at all. It's pretty flat here. Um, but for others with little rent to support, there is an effect. So it's very heterogeneous across people. And to understand the impact, you really have to model that heterogeneity there. It has an impact and uh, this is key, I guess, you know, we all want to see this kind of thing that um, what I've done here is put the histogram of hours of work uh, for two groups. One is on the left, the group across years, right through the reform by the reform is is 10 years ago now in the um, in the at the turn of the millennium. And there's the big reform we've had expansion since. And you can see at the bottom left, there's a big spike in hours at 16. That's where the big incentive is. If you get a part-time job, you can get this additional transfer. On the right, that's a group that's not eligible because you have to have young children to be eligible in your family. And uh, so you can see, and as you go down, the, it's an expansion from no reform at all into a more generous reform. And you can see the focus on people in work, at least working part-time. So a big increase in employment, actually, or quite a big increase in employment, and particularly around part-time work. So that was important. And then finally, the other thing we learned is that you can put incentives in place, but not everybody takes them up. And this is always a complicated thing with a tax and benefit model. That is, how do you get at um, the take-up? And you need, by the way, a model to do this, because you have to take individual families in your data and work out what they would be eligible for if they took everything and then what do they get and that's comparing the predictions of the model with what we actually have in the data and one thing we've learned is that the more people are eligible for the more likely they are to take up so as you increase eligibility you get more people into a program naturally uh, but that has a big impact on the way we think of reform so what happened, uh, by the way, uh, behind this, when you think of that complexity, that makes you think that we'd be really much better off if we could integrate benefits, you know, rather than separate pro processes for applying, 
try and integrate them. And that's been one of the big successes in the UK, actually. And we certainly pushed for that after seeing these pictures is to provide a, a credit, a universal credit, in fact, that uh, covers, um, that contains all these different pieces um, that we saw before in the picture wrapped up into one. And that's the blue line here. It takes all the different allowances. It's only just been rolled out now and pr produces a, t a tax credit, a credit, an, uh, an in-work benefit and a benefit uh, that's fairly smooth. Eligibility uh, doesn't change. Eligibility doesn't change in the sense that you get an automatic adjustment to the amount you're eligible for. Of course, there's still a design issue. How should we think about the blue line here? But you can see the idea here. You can take a complex system and overlay it with a, um, a simpler one. And if you didn't worry about take up and how people access different parts of the welfare system, you know, you wouldn't really worry about this at all. Another feature of this is that it's completely removed the hours condition at 16 hours. So it's much flatter now. And that's going to have an important uh, outcome, as I explain. So what have we learned? Um, well, modeling the complete tax and welfare system is key especially for understanding effective marginal rates, participation tax rates, the extent of redistribution, as well as the complexity that individuals and families face. And as you think about complexity, take up matters, the stigma, hassle costs, information frictions, that can reduce effectiveness and motivates these welfare benefit integration reforms. And then finally, in a way, the main part of the main reason for doing this and to think about these reforms is really to break what we call the iron tri triangle of welfare reform. That is what we'd like to do is be able to think about reforms that raise living standards on those of low earnings, at the same time encourage work and economic self-sufficiency and keep government costs low. And that's exactly the motivation for EITC, WFTC, these in work conditional benefits which are now so popular and um but of course when we did that we were optimistic but really we should have looked a bit more closely at the importance of dynamic effects and uh, that's where i was going to go to in the last few uh, slides um the idea is that welfare produces obviously reforms have redistributive impact and therefore they provide insurance for people and they affect their savings their pensions and their human capital incentives and i just want to think a little bit more about um, the human capital incentives because they've turned out to be uh, quite important all of these reforms were motivated by a desire to help support low earning families and provide incentive to be into the labor market and self-sufficiency but do they incentivize self-sufficiency? And that's what we've uh, been looking at. And really to do that, you have to combine your tax and benefit model with panel data, either population panel data from administrative sources or good survey data. And that's what we used here for this swathe of, of history, looking right back to the 1990s. This is the data that's stored at Essex and uh, we have tax and benefit model working on every year like Euromod and uh, that's an important thing to be able to do so you can look across time and the nice thing about a panel is it's going to follow people over time and you can see the impact of reforms on families and individuals and then on their try and look at the impact on their behavior and there's a whole set of kind of what I call key data features to really do that well. But um, a feature of this, which I know is really central everywhere now, is what happens to different education groups as they progress through the labor market. And perhaps one of the most important things that we've learned in Latin America is that these profiles have moved around and much of the reduction in inequality has been argued has come from the reduction of the profile, wage profile of the higher educated as more people have become higher educated. Uh, although it's not 
completely clear that that really is what's driving what's happened in Chile. But at the bottom of the distribution, it's a very flat profile. And really that um, that's kind of summarizes one of the key points. And that is that there's really not much progression at the bottom. And um, just getting people into jobs has typically turned out not to be enough to earn their way out of uh, at least relative uh, poverty. And uh, what we do in this, and uh, I, I, I won't have time to spend any time on the model, but it's fun to kind of think about bringing dynamics of a model of how wages and earnings evolve over time. That's a dynamic panel data model where you're looking at what, hap what you did last period on what's happening today, in particular to earnings, and then try and feed that through the tax and benefit model and say, well, okay, we have got this reform that's changed current income in this way. How's it affecting tomorrow's earnings and income? And what we do there is set up a model which allows these incentives for part-time and full-time work to influence wages. And that's the key point here. I won't spend any time on this apart from, you know, and if you want to follow it up, it is, I think, quite interesting and might be interesting kind of dynamics now to start looking at even in um, Latin American countries where typically the distribution work has been, has not really exploited uh, the dynamics of uh, behavior so much, I think. And what we, all we did here was look at the impact of working full-time and part-time on tomorrow's earnings, on tomorrow's wages. And remember that reform, it got people into work, but it particularly affected the incentive to part-time work. And what the results showed, and I'll spend hardly any time on this, but this is the, uh, the parameters of the underlying process, you know, returns to experience much higher for university than secondary. They can fall the more university people there are, but it's still higher there. There's a depreciation rate, it's just, you know, your skills depreciate. But the key thing we looked at here was how part-time work was affecting tomorrow's earnings. And indeed, if part-time work was half the effect, you'd have a 0.5 there in that line, the bottom line of the table, but it's only like 0.13 or 0.1. That says that part-time work doesn't get you anywhere near the wage growth that full-time work does. And we dug more into detail of this, of course, but still what it kind of says is that work alone is not enough. You have to think about what people are doing in work and the kinds of investments they're making. And um, in, a, in a summary, we kind of find that work experience is strongly complementary, much lower returns, even if they could be growing for uh, lower educated and for part-time work. And it's not a route out of low earnings. And that's something that would be great to explore uh, because when you're thinking about the, what the dynamics of family income as the tax and benefit system affects them, this is really key. And um, what it means is that when you're thinking of welfare reform, the importance of low returns to work experience for low education really changes the way you think you might set up the incentives. And it, the bottom line is, in most welfare systems, there's very little incentive for active investment in progression by either workers or firms. In fact, it can go the other way. This, as I showed you here, there can be an incentive for flatter profiles. And one thing we know is that if people's earnings profiles are flat, they're very unhappy with the way their uh, world of work is, is developing. And of course, you can do it now start looking at what, what works. And we have a lot of recent work now looking at how the tax and benefit system affects incentives for training, for a variety of other uh, uh, things there. And I, I put a, a summary there, but the policy implications really is that we should be combining, we should be combining incentives for progression and human capital investments with welfare. And that means that when we're thinking of our models, we have to kind of think about uh, the dynamics of incentives. And uh, that's a kind of key message from this. Anyway, that was really just to give you a flavor of where the kind of 
research frontier, I think, in the relationship between tax and benefit modeling and the evolution of family incomes and inequality are. And the key, the key to recent research is to bring together tax and benefit modeling with the earned incomes of individuals in the family and the paths of their earnings, and I should say savings. I've left savings and pensions to one side here. I know they're key in Latin America as well, uh, but I can only focus on one or two things. And I feel we've really got to move away from a purely static analysis, the impact and tax and benefits on family income, and, exa and examine the underlying dynamic incentives and the path across the working life and life cycle. Because this work has found little overall progression for low educated, certainly in the UK and the US. Employment alone is not enough to escape poverty. And it's a real challenge to uh, at least the modern welfare agenda, where you just look at the static effects of these things on poverty and income inequality, and don't recognize the impact as you go through lifetime and these diverging wage profiles. Um, and particularly uh, the low rates of on the job tra training and the lack of incentive in these systems for either individuals or firms uh, to provide uh, provide training and then putting everything in a family context where assortativeness is really key and we've seen that in recent papers on wealth and everything that families are groups of people and those people can be very assortative on their skills and, and wages, which kind of come together to really enhance the underlying inequality. And we have to think about how to design uh, welfare and to, whether they should be individualized or family based. Implications for a policy I'm gonna to draw to a close, Andreas, I'm sure I've gone way over, apologies for that. Um, but I think, you know, what we've learned is that by bringing this together, we 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 found and that's what the tax and model benefit modeling did was to think of designing things that offset the adverse incentives and means testing encourage employment and they're well targeted to reducing poverty in low earnings families but they produce little of these dynamic incentives that we would really like in thinking of uh, micro policy and we should avoid uh, adverse incentives there and somehow tie them together with what's going on in terms of um, wage progression and training and incentives there. And we have lots of uh, ideas about how to do that. A little aside on minimum wages, minimum wages are really a complement, I always think, to this, because once you put people in families, they're really not so well, and hours of work, they're not so well targeted towards uh, low earnings and poverty. They're more targeted towards what they are, and that is low wages and they should be a complement as as i said and um very like uh, the debate on formality the, the growth in sort of self-employment uh, means that one policy when we're thinking about tax and benefit modeling we should be looking at what's happening for the those in the informal sector in self-employment in social self-employment and compare the offsetting effects of the different tax and welfare system that they face. I had a little thing on what happens after COVID, but I've gone way over. So I'm just going to, there's a bunch of references there. But thanks very much uh, for inviting me. I hope that was kind of useful little insight into the various these reviews, what I think are some of the key things we've learned uh, about the importance of micro simulations and some of the challenges going forward in trying to understand the dynamics of the impacts on savings, on earnings of these tax and benefit reforms. So thanks, everybody. Well, um, can you hear me? I don't know if I'm on here. Well, thank you so much for very interesting uh, talk. Um, I have, there are several questions uh, from the audience, but let, let me start with, with one from me, since I'm moderating this, I have the privilege of asking a quick question. And that is, you, it's interesting this, uh, what you find that at the lower end of the income distribution, uh, you have a lot of part-time work. That is, hourly wages are quite constant, mm. but 
but you have a lot of people uh, working part time. Now, what what I was wondering to what extent that's in, that's a decision by by individuals. That is, they they are there. There are opportunities now to work, to be self employed, not have a boss, have flexibility, and to some extent that's a willing or a decision made by individuals uh, uh, somehow uh, they want that that's that's one question let me let me uh raise a couple of questions uh from the audience one is how do you incorporate uh digitalization i guess that's uh automatization uh in the labor market in in the model and uh and the other the third question um, again, how do you incorporate migration and automatization effect in inequality? These two issues are quite important for Latin America, especially for low skilled workers. Um, so I'll, I'll leave you with those three questions for now. Uh, okay. If we have time, I'll, I'll take up some other questions. Yeah, thanks, Sandra. Thanks, everybody. It's always much easier if I'm there and can interact and I'd love to do that, but let me try and address them. Yeah, I'm not being particularly judgmental here uh, on flexibility. I think um, if you look back to the motivation of many tax and benefit reforms that we modeled in a rather static way, and we all just continue to do so, they had, um, they had other objectives. Uh, not just to relieve current period poverty and reduce inequality. They were there to with this self-sufficiency idea that if you can get people in work, they would earn their way out of poverty. And I think what we know is that that may be, uh, if that's a good objective, uh, then you might want to put incentives in place to adjust for that. But people re respond to incentives. And if you design something that persuades them not to invest in uh, skills and not to uh, look at progression, then of course what you find is they don't. And uh, that's an outcome of your policy. And so the way I would respond to that is policy has a design. If, if it's got unanticipated effects, you should take those into account. And if they're not in line with your original policy, you should think about adapting them and uh, but uh, of course in all of this you take individuals as making their choices and there's no question with the growth of solar self-employment is being about the partly about the desire for flexibility and partly a response by firms and workers to reduce their tax bill because they pay lower taxes they don't make contributions and so if you kind of outsource a group of workers into solo self-employment the costs are reduced and we also know that progression falls. There are opportunities for progression seem to be uh, seem to be reduced. So there's a kind of a lot of effects there that we're beginning to understand. And I guess they're rather similar uh, to the kinds of uh, effects on human capital investments and progression and other things that happen if people fall into informality or choose informality in. Um, in Latin America. So I think there, there I, I take your point completely. I think flexibility, you always want to allow that. But in designing policies, you know, you, you've decided to have an effect on something. And one needs to understand what those effects are. And if they're affecting savings and human capital in a way that's not in line with what you originally wanted in your policy, then of course you should uh, you may wish to rethink. It certainly caused a rethink, by the way. So the reforms that we've seen have been largely because the, the, the outcomes were not what people had expected. The static outcomes were, but not the dynamic ones. So I think there are really good lessons. It's great for researchers, of course, because um, it's a challenge to try and figure out how all these things work uh, together. And often when people are looking at reforms, they look at one reform, they don't look at interactions, and they don't recognize people in families. So they look at a minimum wage without realizing that, um, you know, there's a minimum wage on one person in a family, and you have to think about how it affects family income. The last question on migration is also really quite central. And the debate is uh, 
red hot in the UK, <laughs> as you may know, there's a lot of reforms to reduce um, the uh, immigration of low skill workers, um, especially from what was uh, when we were in Europe. And, and I think the jury's still out that we had a huge uh, migration of relatively, uh, uh, I wouldn't say completely unskilled workers, but lower skilled workers. And the effect on wages, um, it's, it, you have to remember that um, the jury really is out on this, isn't it, Andres? Because, you know, I was thinking of the Nobel Prize a couple of weeks ago, David Card finds very little effect and others find a large effect. Um, the perception is in communities is that it has a large effect. Uh, but of course, we, you know, we know if you add workers into an economy that are working, you know, they have a number of effects on demand, on the change in capital and on um, the whole labor market itself. And usually that dampens the immediate effect. What we found in the UK is that the workers that come in assimilate and tend to move up the distribution rather more rapidly than uh, incumbents. But overall, uh, I guess what we find is that um, the effect is fairly muted on uh, on wages. That's one thing, that's a kind of labor market effect. The, the second effect is how do you design tax and benefit policies? If you're very generous to your, let's call them your own group of workers, then that provides an incentive for people to come in from other jurisdictions which are not so generous. And I think that's a, a real challenge as well. How, do you want to change the eligibility of um, workers, if you want, who've been in the country or were born in the country or are citizens of the country? Do you want different uh, set of eligibility criteria? And one way that people have moved on this is to say, okay, well, that's exactly what contributed contribution based social insurance systems provide because you need to build up contributions and that requires working in the jurisdiction. And uh, that's one of the successes of Scandinavian economies, by the way, is they're very contribution based. And in fact, when immigrants arrive, they're eligible to relatively little. They're eligible to quite a bit, actually, but it's still the baseline. And I think that is uh, quite an inch, whether that's ethical or not, I'm not sure, but it's certainly an interesting aspect. Our kind of static, immediate eligibility to welfare, um, of course, um, doesn't have that mechanism of requiring people build up contributions uh, until they, uh, until they're built up to be um, eligible for those types of uh, welfare benefits. So I think that is an open question, and I really like the question. I don't know how it would work in Latin America. It's a really great thing to think about, and it pushes you towards contributory based insurance systems if you want to expand their generosity, I think. So there's the effect on the labor market and there's the effect on eligibility to uh, tax and welfare. The digitalization, I'm not quite sure what aspect of that was this kind of a number. One is um, one is uh, the kind of digitalization of platforms, and uh, that's obviously behind a lot of the growth in Uber and solo self-employment and and those uh, aspects there. And I, I guess that so that's that's been a very important aspect. I don't see that as particularly challenging for welfare and tax. We have to keep more more uh, we have to be able to you know record things that are going on uh, but in a way digitalization gives exactly that position and indeed that's maybe what the question was getting at that digitalization means that we have um, real-time data and real-time and and able to um, interact with uh, with individuals in our communities uh, much more immediately in terms of the response of welfare and of taxation and the days which are still in operation in the US when you get your tax credit, you know, probably 18 months after you had your low income because it comes when you put your tax request in for the following year, 
you know, we can now think about real time, real time uh, adjustments to welfare and benefits. And uh, that is kind of exciting. In the UK, we have re real time digital tax records now that we use in research as well, uh, which keep all the all those things up to date. But it might, I may have got that question completely around the wrong way. So let me know if that's the case. Okay, no, I, I think uh, I think you tackled it correctly. I think that was the idea, the digital economy. Um, one last question, if if we may, uh, Richard, um, and this has to do with your result or your conclusion that employment is not enough to get people out of poverty. Um, perhaps several decades ago, it was enough to get people in employment. And, and that was a way out of poverty. And, 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 and this does not seem to be the case right now. And therefore you have to complement employment with on the job education or, or uh, some skills, uh, uh, learning skills uh, and education, the idea of complementary between work and education. And there's a question regarding that, that it's hard to reduce inequality and improve access to higher income for those skilled workers in Latin America given that they have low skills in education and there's a lot of informality and poor institutions, there's unequal access to education, uh, poor training programs. Uh, they usually work in informal uh, firms if they work or self-employed. How do you tackle that problem? How do you design policies to increase human capital for low-income workers that may be working in informal sector or, um, or in, in, in very uh, small firms uh, that are hard to, to target and, or hard to design a, a program for, um, for training? Yeah, well, that's a, a really difficult one, of course. Um, I mean, overall training hasn't been hugely successful for uh, low educated workers, you know, we, it almost takes some education to get further training. We, we see that all the time, successful training. And that's partly because successful training always requires some kind of qualification. You know, now we almost never get any impact of training on future earnings and behavior or it, 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 on earnings and incomes, unless there's some kind of accreditation. You know, the great success of the German system is that everything's accredited in a national way. And so the worker can take it wherever they like. They can be self-employed. You know, you can be a plumber, uh, but you, you get your you get your accredited. And I think that's very important. So the qualification accreditation is important. But you know, if you have very little initial education, what kind of things can you actually uh, design that work? And I think there's a lot of work on that because that, that's a common problem everywhere. You know, it's not that the US and the UK don't have very a large group of very unskilled workers that are very hard um, to get, it, you know, human capital development. And there's a lot of nice work on what kind of skills are, are are most useful there and a lot of work on soft skills uh, for example i know that's kind of perhaps obvious but the kind of things where you can get accredited for uh for skills that are very very important for firms it turns out there's nice work on uh, in africa on that as well as our own work on soft skills and uh but then you have to somehow figure out how to accredit those and there's a lot of interesting work on how to do that. So I, I would say that that's kind of in the frontier. It's at this frontier of what has now been called good jobs, <laughs> good jobs for low educated workers. That's good jobs that have career progression and all of that. Now, what happens if they're in informality or in um, hard to kind of find? I think then you, you really have to get that working on top of their situation. So, you know, the one kind of positive aspect of the pandemic is we've kind of learned how to provide learning and training through digital access. And I think, of course, that's been quite unequal, unequal, unequally, unequally distributed, but you can see that there is the potential now for having accredited programs available to very low educated uh, via digital uh, access. 
on particular things that are in a sense outside their workplace. Um, you'd like it to be involved in the workplace, but that's often very hard to do. So I think that's right at the front. You know, if I thought of one big policy that's been thought of in great detail right now, it's how to use um, digital access to improve uh, the skills at the bottom of the distribution, not, not just of the educated, which is certainly happening. So I think that's very exciting. It's a bit away from tax and welfare, but I, I think it's a, it's a really good thing. And one reason I, it's not so different is that you could imagine, uh, you know, like we have conditional cash transfers, but make the conditioning on access to some of these uh, schemes. So conditioning for the firm, the firm may, um, you know, the firm or the worker has access to certain types of welfare or benefits, but only, you know, with some conditioning that they take up some of these uh, digital uh, type investments, um, you know, but that's very much thinking through, but I, I suspect it's as important in, in Chile as it is uh, anywhere else. And it's very exciting because we worry that after COVID, you know, despite as I put on the slide, I didn't show you, you know, there's a great move to do great, good things and to redistribute. But in fact, the whole world has really shifted to a world where, you know, the skills in IT and e-commerce have suddenly become hugely valuable and they're nearly all associated with higher education. So maybe offsetting some of the declines you've seen in the higher education premium in Latin America, because that's really where all the uh, where all the demand is is now, and uh, so it's to try and think about how do we harness that and get kind of good jobs and those types of things happening at the bottom of the distribution. Anyway, it's a good good topic. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Blondell. We're very thankful for your very interesting talk and your time. And uh, we'll leave you now and. Um, we hope uh, to have you in Chile sometime next year, hopefully. And yep. we can continue these discussions. And we'll take a break now uh, and, and we'll come back at 11. Así que tomamos ahora bien el receso y eh, le agradecemos al profesor Blondel de nuevo. Very much. Thank you. <laughs> y volvemos a las 11. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks, everyone. See you again soon. Thank you.